Hey there, this is Lee Winnell, writer and director of the film Upgrade and the co-creator of Saw and Insidious, and you are listening to Without Your Head. Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Gill. That would make me terrible, Troy. Mm-hmm. And on the line, I think we have the, the wicked pizza, Eric <laughs> Irvin. <laughs> Welcome. Also known as Amazon Eve sometimes. Exactly. Thing, uh, exactly. Go, what the and hell is that? <laughs> and, and maybe in the future she hulk which will be awesome. without the green without, without, without the green <laughs> yeah we, we try to do that without the green guys how are you guys this evening uh, i'm doing very good yeah i'm wonderful thanks how about mm-hmm. you i'm fantastic getting better all the time i only have good news i'm going to be working on another television show but i can't talk about it because it's one of the toppy secret ones Oh, so, that's exciting. Which is you, yeah. which is, which is, it's always exciting. You'll just surge when um, <laughs> you do a hit show, you do another hit show, you do another good show, and then all of a sudden your independent film just goes knocking out of the park. Um, yeah, that's awesome. I'm very excited about Chimera. I'm very excited about it and what it's been doing and, and changing thinking about stem cell research. So. So good to be on your show, guys. I just yeah. recently visited Boston to do our premiere. It was a little chilly, but it was a lovely time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How did that go? How did that go? The uh, the premiere for Chimera. It was lovely. It was absolutely lovely. We had uh, Maurice Haynes and Captain mm-hmm. Quinlan was there, and uh, I invited one of my fans, Nina Lamalis from, uh, from from Twitter. And she got to be there with me. And there she is. If you look at her at Mina Lamalas at Amazon Eve on Twitter, you can see her. And she's right there with me going, hi, <laughs> which is the premiere with me. So I, <laughs> I enjoyed I enjoyed doing little things like that. Oh, that's very nice of you. I, I really like Chimera. I had uh, Maurice on the show uh, a few months ago. Uh-huh. And uh, so how, how did you get involved in the movie? How did I get involved in the movie? Mm-hmm. Well, I was like right after, well, I think I interviewed, not interviewed, auditioned for it right when we were just finishing up American Horror Story Freak Show. I was in, I was in uh, New Orleans getting ready to fly to Europe. And uh, I put this out there and started working in May of 2015. And it's been a journey. It's been a lovely journey. And, um, I got to go to Boston and see the premiere, and I went to the Phoenix Film Festival, which was night and day in terms of like cold and then <laughs> nice and hot. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've never, I've actually never been to Phoenix. Yeah, it can get be really, get really warm out there. It's known for that. Uh huh. So, but yeah, Ch- yeah, Chimera is a really interesting story. And like you said, it asked questions about uh, mm-hmm. stem cell research and. Um, uh, kind of not necessarily artificial intelligence, but there's a lot of um, you know when did, when is something uh, living, when is it life, and uh, it's a really interesting science fiction film. Well, there's another issue about Fermi's paradox and Moore's law. I was talking to um, mm-hmm. one of the radio show, Maurice and I were talking about um, future advancements and transhumanism and our our show talks of do we want to live forever? I mean, we, we can 3D print hard things. I'll be able to 3D print organs and we'll be completely replacement parts in the future with the stem cell research that they've got coming up. Do we want to be Frankenstein's little critters running around with 200 year lifespan? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Spooky stuff. So what do you guys think of all that? Uh, well, uh, that's what I like about science fiction is, um, you know, it, mm-hmm. it takes something that's starting, uh, th- that's around right now and kind of ask, you know, questions, you know, in the future, what will this be like, you know, stuff that's starting because really, it, you know, it seems like it's futuristic, but it's stuff that's, you know, around right now. It's just, you know, more advanced than the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what do I, what it, do I think? I don't, I mean. Uh, immortal. I mean, uh, we already have so many people now. The, the the world would really be crowded if everyone lived forever. Mm-hmm. It is. Or what do you th- I think mm-hmm. we have? Eight, aren't we just shy of eight billion right now? And 
Probably. I believe there has been speculation that the carrying capacity of the planet is 10 billion. Oh, that's kind of knocking on the door, then. Mm-hmm. That is knocking on the door. I mean, we look at Moore's laws, like per square inch. Circuitry has doubled. The amount mm-hmm. of circuits you see in per square inch has doubled. Look at our iPhones and what they can do versus 20 years ago, the, la- the oh, tabletop man. computers. Mm-hmm. So, and yeah. it makes you wonder about something. And I, it, it, the whole the whole project made me, made me think about Fermi's paradox. Like, are we going to become technologically obsolete, human mm-hmm. beings, mm-hmm. Oh, unless we figure out a way question. to evolve? Well, it's, there's many different ideas yeah. in Fermi's paradox about why haven't space aliens come to visit here. I mean, it's perfectly reasonable that intelligent life can exist because we exist with the billions of possible planets. I mean, for just for life to exist. And then intelligent life to exist. And intelligent life that exists long enough to communicate and to send messages and to have local travel. And then interstellar, well, not interstellar, we can, we can travel within our solar system. We've been able to send out, you know, probes. But, you know, interstellar and to be able to travel interstellarly what kind of technology, the technology that it takes to get there will obsolete, we will become obsolete before the technology arrives that creates that possibility for us to be there. That's why we become technologically isolated and that's one of Fermi's paradoxes. So, interesting stuff, especially science fiction. And yeah. our, our movie crosses over into, it, it's kind of genreless. You know, there's, there's a drama element and there's a horror element, and there's a sci-fi element. Those so are usually my moments. favorite things. It, it, but there's a touching moment. There's, there's, a, there's a true family drama going on. And one thing this business does to you when you go and you do a movie, you get to know all the moving parts that are going on behind the scenes. But it's a magic trick for the audience when they see it. Um, is that something you'd be interested in? Uh, you said you know behind the scenes stuff, how how movies work. Uh, would you ever be interested in uh, in directing or producing or, or writing? I have written and I have directed short little shorts. You can see a few of them out on YouTube. Oh, cool! I put one out there that I called uh, "How to Amazon Proof Your Home" and little things that I've done when I when I was modeling in Milan, Italy back in the day. That was mm-hmm. about a few years ago. <laughs> now going on 10 years ago and um, my travels and my studies and I'm planning on going back to school I'd like to uh, get my master's and, uh, either either philosophy or or uh, or psych um, there's a lot on my plate right now and I'm, I'm just really excited about what this movie does in terms of open doors and ideas about mm-hmm. what we can do with stem cell research and the, eye, and the implications of transhumanism, our mm-hmm. understanding of the possibility of limiting ourselves or maximizing ourselves. Is there a limit to the human condition? Can we live in a world in the future where computers and AI are going to outsmart us? There's like an IQ threshold for human beings. It's amazing mm-hmm. stuff. And mm-hmm. when, we, when, when our movie hits the market, right now it's doing the film festival circuit. Mm-hmm. When it hits the market, um, I'm really excited about the questions that it will raise. Mm-hmm. I mean, just not kind just of recently. Yeah. I would say recently with, mm-hmm. uh, with AI, they, uh, they shut, because they, they had some, uh, the AI started to communicate and the humans couldn't, uh, you know, decipher what they're saying, and so they shut them down. You know, I was just recently, right? So, uh, you know, it's, I think, it's almost you know stuff from uh, Terminator. <laughs> well, there's iRobot, also Isaac Asimov, um, science mm-hmm. fiction novel, mm-hmm. and, and I've, always th- I, I've always thought Pinocchio is is sort of an uh, artificial intelligent uh, story. Yeah, it's a good it way is. to look at it. Yeah, mm-hmm. 
a little different, but it's. A, yeah. I think it's a lot of the, the a lot of same uh, elements. What's like? Mm-hmm. So, uh, before before you got into uh, before you're in Chimera, what what kind of um, what kind of movies interested you? Are you into science fiction or horror? Or? Well, I'm 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 all for a good old Dungeons and Dragons kind of show, and I've been okay. Been watching oh, rock Game of on. <laughs> Game, Game, Game of Throners. I'm a I'm a old school first edition uh-huh. advanced. Well, first edition, like the old box set kind of Dungeons and Dragons player. <laughs> That's uh, Neil and I do the same yeah. way. So, Yep. Yeah, Troy and I grew up playing D and D ever yep. since I was a little kid, probably about six. Yep. We are officially in the geek club, and uh, <laughs> nothing so I've wrong. Been bald, I've been involved in gaming, you know, like that. Now I kind of just stick to game night with friends, and uh, every once in a while, a challenging chess match. Mm. I was I was sixth grade yeah. chess club champion. Hmm. So. I played in high school and a little bit uh-huh. in uh, college. I was yeah. I went to a small college in Northern California called Las Vegas College, mm-hmm. and I played at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. I was in the Lawrence. I was in the Super Geek Club. I did, we I we were really <laughs> the whole school gave me access to the to like the super brains of the world. Right, uh-huh. we take this little time out once a week and play chess with each other. <laughs> it was just really cool. Uh, oh, that's fabulous! I, yeah, I, I did go to chess club in high school, but I have to say, uh, I regret kind of leaving. But the, my chess teacher in high school was very weird. He carried, her, which is fine, but he carried around a chess uh, set in his back pocket, and he would recreate uh, uh-huh. like all, he would recreate Napoleon era chess matches. And uh, it was just it was a little too much for me, so I, I left the uh, chess club. And, and, but uh, I haven't played in a lot of time. I was a diehard chess uh, teacher, man. It was. Uh-huh. Mr. Ro- Mr. Rose. Uh-huh. It was very weird. But, uh, well, did, but D&D, I haven't played in a lot of time, but I definitely grew up uh, playing D&D. Well, you know, the old school with the dice. And it's not the same playing it on, like, on a computer, I don't think. It's not the well, same without human on, interaction. Uh, it's, it's, it's a role-playing game, but its playability is limited because it's heavily dependent upon book role. Mm-hmm. You understand? That's why advanced versions of it came along to take you out of the book and make you interact with the game more because it was originally designed to be a role-playing game. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, it went yeah. more into game theory as, as people utilized as they started playing it. Mm-hmm. You ever get into LARPing? Yeah. I don't know what LARPing is. I, I know that there was a game, uh, uh, I think Magic, it was called Magic, The right. Gathering. Oh, yeah, that, that was a card uh, game. Right, it was an offshoot, which didn't deal with dice. It just, it meant playing certain game conditions and condition precedents on, on cards. And, yeah. You know, trying to defeat your opponent based on what cards you play. Mm-hmm. And it, it left the role playing side, and the part that made me go into acting was the role playing game. Mm-hmm. I love the role playing. So by the time I got into college, I started studying theater and taking acting classes, and just like a lot of hopeful, you know, we do a lot of theater and independent film up and through our career until we can, you know, land a decent role on a television spot, and another one, another one, and we have a, then we have an acting career, and we start working. Mm-hmm. Here I am. I get to interview with you guys and talk about how I got here. Perseverance yeah. nope. and hard uh, work. Mm-hmm. Uh, were your parents supportive of you uh, becoming an actor? Mm, I think they were reluctant. I think there was less than uh, enthusiasm, you could say. Um, uh, I was more to go go take on one of the harder sciences or study law or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if it's still live yeah. or not, but did, did they get to see you uh, act in, in, in TV and in films? I think my father has. My mom has not. My mom has not had a chance to see me perform. She died in 1990, so... Oh, okay. You know, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about That's that. That's okay. That's the way to go. You know. My father, I'm sure, has seen me by now. I know my family is. My family is very proud of what I've I've accomplished. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. Now, can I maintain it? Can you, you know, the career is so fickle. Sometimes you have little dry spots and then you have hits and then you have, it's, it's chugging along. I'm very excited. Uh, it is hard work because you are the product. So you're always working on yourself and improving your craft and going out and auditioning and doing gigs here and there. And I always keep myself in performance mode. So I'm always traveling and performing. Mm-hmm. So how did the role for uh, Amazon Eve come about? Well, that's a character I created back in 2009. It was my modeling name. It was a wrestling name originally. I went out and oh, wrestled really? guys for a living. Yeah, people don't know that. I, I, I did this mixed session wrestling thing on Travel the World and it led me to uh, modeling. Wow. One, of my, one, of my fan, one of my fans <laughs> connected me to someone in Australia on my way to Australia. And after that, straight to Milan. Don't pass go. Don't collect two hundred dollars. <laughs> no. And then the Guinness Book in two thousand eleven, and I held that until the new Russian gal out hyped me. Oh no! Uh, I didn't know this. Yeah. Yes. So I've been out hyped by a, bas- a Russian basketball playing woman. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm a big wrestling fan. So I didn't know that about about wrestling. Did you go to wrestling school? No, 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 no. It's kind of a loose, loose. Uh, it's sort of an offshoot. This is before women started doing mixed martial arts, mm-hmm. UFC style. So mm-hmm. it's women in combat sport. Mm-hmm. Sort of like Fight Club. It's kind of an underground thing. Was mm-hmm. it well known? We don't talk sure about mixed session wrestling. <laughs> club. <laughs> Uh, Mixed session wrestling club. <laughs> Whatever. You just broke the rule. It, 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 well, it's kind of a fetish because you, you see variations <laughs> of uh, mud and mm-hmm. oil and jello, and it has all these you know other connotations. Um, you know, I I also did like boxing. You know, with box guys, mm-hmm. and uh, I learned how to dominate and how to take control. Use my height. Mm-hmm. So well, you, you, you all, you yeah. all know, you all know I'm six foot eight, right? We yes, yes, that. yes, yes. yes, yes. Yeah, I'm five. I'm five foot five, so it's, it's much much taller than me. <laughs> oh my God, You're I'm kind of in between both of you. So yeah, it's really like in between. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So well, how did you get? So, how did how did, uh, how did Amazon Eve end up as uh, in American Horror Story? Well, I auditioned mm-hmm. when um, the, by this time I've already done a couple TV shows. So I auditioned for this one. And the part originally was slated to be uh, a, a tall man named Johnny Long in the Pants, which of course <laughs> Long in the Pants. Like, I think Ryan Murphy came up with that one. It's a Ryan Murphy one. Uh-huh. Long in the pants. So we have Amazon Eve and mm-hmm. took my name and put it on his show. She has her own little following. I'm very pleased at what I've accomplished. Oh, I'm sure. That's excellent. So they, I think I think I answered that. That's a good answer to the question. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, well, once you got the role, did, had, were you, had you watched your previous seasons of American Horror Story? Were you uh, a fan of the show? Or? Oh, yeah, I did. I did watch it. I was, I was kind of already up to date with the show, and then they showed up. Mm-hmm. I didn't expect yeah, to get the part. I didn't expect them to rewrite it to be a woman, so it changed their focus. Yeah. So well, what do you think about your performance made them, uh, you know, hey, this is let's go with this direction? That's kind of a big thing to totally rewrite the character for you. Well, I, you know, it's a character I've been playing, so it didn't, mm-hmm. you know, it's something... I already had ready to go and I enjoyed myself. Mm-hmm. Put it that way. Yeah. Now, you know, as a lot of um, American Horror Story, a lot of the same actors. Uh, so what was it like to be one of the, the newbies, I guess, in American Horror Story uh, with some of the regulars? Well, it's kind of a dream come true seeing Jessica Lang and Michael Chiklis and 
Kathy Bates and Angela Bassett. Oh my God, you guys seen, you all have seen Black Panther, right? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Yep. Tremendous movie. Yeah. yeah. Great movie. Amazing movie. Nominal. I mean, we're talking more for the record book kind of mm. movie. Mm. And I'm just so shocked that I've gotten to work with so many talented and amazing people. I'm very blessed and very grateful to, to have a achieved that in my life and there's there's that moment of humility that comes over you when you produce such an amazing project mm -hmm. and it continues it's a continuing story mm -hmm. they might yeah. they might appear to be disjointed from episode from season to season but they are connected mm -hmm. uh, not just because you're here but that was my my personal favorite uh, season of the show, uh, Freak Show, was uh, I, I liked the the setting of it, and uh, I just thought it was uh, for me it was my favorite from the beginning. Yeah, that time. one was tough to beat. It really was. We had. Uh, I was excited about it. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to. Do, years, I, I would. I would do it again in a heartbeat. <laughs> I was just saying that you think you'd ever you'll ever return to American Horror Story. Either as Amazon Eve or another character? I don't know. I never know these things. It's when, 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 I, and a lot of times I can't even talk about where I'm working until they advertise it. So, uh huh. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to get you in trouble. Really? Right? You tell, right, right. No, 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 no. It's, it, it, I just got done performing the vagina monologue down in Los Angeles. Oh, really? One of Sheena Metal's production. Yeah. You know. mm -hmm. To the radio show, and uh, I've been just very blessed with a lot of projects getting Chimera and then falling south. And there's another movie out there called Dead Squad, and it's not out yet, mm -hmm. but it's what, on IMDb, so you can see it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, what's that? What's that movie about? Dead Squad, yeah. I'm not allowed to talk about that at all. <laughs> that, 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 that would, I, I, I'm just gonna. It's, it's got kind of a hybrid zombie thing, and I can't talk about it though. <laughs> all right, all right. I see. I do see it here, and I'll say you say yeah. it says you play the zombie queen, but uh, that's right on AMV, oh, yeah. so, so so won't get you in trouble. But uh, that's interesting. Yes, I won't be. Yeah, I mean, it's a hybrid zombie. It's just like, say, okay, stay tuned. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. Are, are you a zombie fan? I am not a zombie fan. I like, I like the villain to not be a horde of um, mindless. mindless automatons that chase after you. Mm -hmm. I like the villain to be a little bit more creative, to kind of enjoy their work. Did you all watch Infinity Wars? Oh, yeah. You remember the uh, preacher? Come now, my friends. You wish all be and please kneel because all half of you are going to perish. <laughs> that was funny. Uh, <laughs> Troy actually has a We're about to play too, that. So, uh -huh. I know. That was just, just really fun. funny watching those things. Mm -hmm. uh, well, since you're a D and D fan, did you uh, did you read comics as as a, as, uh, as a youngster as well? I wasn't a comic book fan, you know. I loved mm -hmm. role playing. Um, I loved uh, games. Um, I loved creating. I like drawing and writing and speaking and performing. Mm -hmm. um, I started taking acting classes right out of high school, the college. So, and I went to the Meisner Conservatory in North Hollywood and just cut plugging along and did theater until opportunity showed up to make me a professional. Oh, I studied yeah, I, law for a little bit and went on the business and legal affairs side of the business for a few years. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so when you were doing that, uh, what made you, you know, decide you needed to go, you need to go back and do something creative? Opportunity presented itself. That's, I think that was the, the big push. I had a chance to, of course, audition and work 13 episodes, American Horror Story, and that, that put me out there and I've done three movies since uh, I was on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I, I think that was God last January when that aired so. uh, 
Be, be a good time. Yeah, no, I love that. I, I, I personally love that. I've always wanted to be She-Hulk. That's, that's kind of like the <laughs> role that I could play. Uh, and I, and she was supposed to be in this Infinity Wars, but she's owned because there was a cartoon, and I think it's owned by Warner Brothers or Universal. One of those owns it, and they're not willing to give it up. Mm-hmm. I hate so those they didn't like write. That. Well, you know, especially when you're perfectly right, you you don't exactly. you don't need any no CGI needed. You know, <laughs> yep. Very patient masseuse who dubs as a makeup artist. You think you go. <laughs> <laughs> That would be a wicked pizza <laughs> for, your, for your Boston, your Boston fans. There. I just love. I wonder. I wonder where that term comes. The word "wicked." Well, it, it's from Boston. It's wicked pizza. I mean, it's awesome. It's cool. I catch myself doing the wicked every now and then, <laughs> but I, I don't. I don't think I ever say pizza though. I just. It's not in my. Not in my lexicon normally. I think that's a bit too crude, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Wicked will uh, that'll that'll pop out of me all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, I say it all. Oh yeah. Yeah. I hear it. I hear you. Yeah. I'm from yeah, California. Yeah. I don't think I've heard Wicked like the surfers use Wicked. Oh, like okay. Yeah. <laughs> Our surfers out there be Wicked, man. It's a Wicked way, kids, <laughs> stuff like that. But. <laughs> Yeah, most people don't think I have. Uh, they're usually surprised that I'm from uh, Massachusetts because they say I don't I don't have any of the accents. But I think Troy's has it a little bit. Nothing yeah, I got it way more than you do. Yeah. Uh huh. I don't know what that. Can is. I ask you guys? I have a friend out there. His name's Sig Neutron, and he just won a season of Face Off. But I love special effects. And this oh, Face Off! Really something. awesome. Yeah, I, I, I'm fascinated. We talked about, um, we had a big conversation the other night. I was on Game Service House, and we were talking about John Carpenter's The Thing mm. and how instrumental that science fiction was to have practical, effect, practical effects versus the mm. CGI version, the 2001 mm. version that they did. It might have been a little later that um, used CGI instead of the practical effects they used. And I need to go back to that practical effect. It just looked stringier and, and grittier and, and more real. Oh, you know is, what I mean? Absolutely. I always, I always think there's something too about the practical, um, it, uh, there's a weight involved. And I think a lot of times when you're watching CG, uh, you could tell like the weight's not there. And it, even if you're not like really aware, I think it just kind of takes you out of it a little bit. Like, you know, it's, there's something not quite right. Yeah. And uh, I always think, too, like, uh, even, like, not so great, like, bad uh, practical effects still has a lot of charm to it. Uh, bad CG just looks bad, I think. Yeah, yep. Yeah, if your giant yeah, spider doesn't have a shadow and he's, yeah. you know, walking around, he's 50 feet tall and he, you know, walks across the grass without bending a blade, that's, yeah, that takes yeah. you out of something. And the, the the thing, uh, I think that's one of the best all-around movies, because not only does it have all the great special effects, it has great characters and acting, so it's kind of the best of all worlds, you know, put together. Oh, yeah. And the alien is really alien. It's not like a guy in a suit. It's something that's totally, you know, otherworldly. Yeah, that's- I get that. Mm-hmm. And by the way, and, that and was one of the pro- of- that's one of the problems with aliens. It's always some, some actor in a suit. Uh, yep. <laughs> Somebody with a yeah, whistle yeah. in the background going. <laughs> exactly. The nineteen fifties version was like that. Went, oh yeah. <laughs> I can't remember what the fifties science fiction movie was where the alien was like a giant carrot. It was just yeah, like the most from outer bold. space. It, it was just no. such a bogus looking creature. I don't. I, I kind of loved it though, in my own uh-huh. way. Well, you got to give them a little credit. You know, they they, they had limited technology. True. Mm-hmm. Now, and speaking of board games, I just played the uh, the thing uh, board game in, in Texas, and it's a it's an amazing game. I highly recommend it. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, some person you don't know who might be the thing. So. Uh, 
there's a lot to it. It's a really fun game. You got to go around and and search out the thing and find different stuff. And and you know, other players might be taken over by the thing, and you can burn them up. You might also. Oh, there's like a little a paranoia player. going on. Yeah, it really it really brings nice. it into the game. It was a lot of fun. That's I awesome. Really enjoyed it. And it's an old school board game. It's good times. Which you don't see too much anymore, but uh, I enjoy it. Oh, well, you do. There's, there's still some good board games out there. The gaming industry is always looking for new and fascinating abstract strategy games to draw people in. Oh. And uh, there's new ones out there that are fascinating. The whole gaming world is, is evolving. I played a haunted house kind of game once that use characters and use characters with abilities so there's a role-playing aspect to it mm. now one of my favorite games is cards against humanity yes i played that last year in texas for the first i never thought i would like it but we played uh, all night in the in the little bar it was it was a lot of fun well it's one of those games that it's hard to get away with not Hmm, what's the word I'm looking for? Doing things or saying things that are outrageous. Uh-huh. Yeah, the, the yeah, game is completely... There's, there, there, there's a trump card, which is always the biggest, blackest, you know, <laughs> and that, that, that just trumps everything. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest, blackest penis. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's, that's always the, the hidden card in the deck. <laughs> and I should, yeah, I live by a restaurant. Uh, there's a restaurant down the street from me called the BBC, but it's the British Beer Company. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's just called the BBC. I'm kind of unfortunate. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure it's going to get that kind of name on it. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> Might get a completely different clientele, though. Yeah. Oh, I'm oh, sure yes, you I'm... do. I really. I'm, I'm, I'm positive you do. <laughs> <laughs> Some disappointed very, folks yeah. afterwards. Son of a bitch. I'm never coming here again. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, we do what we can with what we have where we are. Uh-huh. True. Uh, yeah, and there's a lot of cool games that pop up, uh, you know, all the time on, uh, like, Kickstarter and, and GoFundMe that, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I think that's where Exploding Kittens, like, uh, at the time, it was, like, the most... Uh, uh, you know, most money in, in a Kickstarter game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a lot of cool. Which stuff. one's that? Uh, it was Exploding Kittens. Really? It was, uh, yeah, it was a card game about oh, exploding. I've kittens. never seen that one. Yeah, I have it. It's fun. Oh. Hello. Hello. Who is this? Hello. This is Mina La Malice. Um, I'm Erica Irvin's biggest fan. Oh, well, here we go, Eric. We well, have the biggest awesome. fan in line. Hi, Nina. Hi, sweetheart. Decided to call in to say hi. Who are you? I'm good. I'm actually, um, I'm actually listening to your radio interview. Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Especially well, with Matt. Is this radio or podcast? Do you, you call it a I radio think it's podcast. or a podcast? Yeah, it's well, podcast. it's it's yes. it's yeah, it's live on the uh, online. Yeah, tonight, actually, but, I was uh, with her at the premiere of Chimera. She invited me. Oh yeah, she mentioned you earlier. She invited me out to the Chimera event. She was a total sweetheart. She's one of the best human beings I've ever met. Oh, that's very nice. Oh, Unfortunately, I couldn't make it. But uh, oh my you know, god, Chimera was such a great it? film. I love it. Yeah, I love. I've seen the movie. I really liked it, but I couldn't make it to the. Like uh, she the, played Dita Groove to a T. Mm-hmm. Like she was awesome. Uh, are you? I, I guess you're in Massachusetts. Oh yeah, wicked. <laughs> are you the one who? Wicked <laughs> <laughs> No, I. Yeah, I, that I didn't that, that, that movie was <laughs> wicked pizza. <laughs> Man, oh my God. So anyway, she invited me out there. We got to hang out, and she's a total sweetheart. Like, and she's really intelligent. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I just absolutely adore her. Like she, like she is an awesome actress. It's very cool. 
When did you become a fan of hers? Over here. <laughs> Um, when I saw, when I first saw her in American Horror Story, I was just captured with her. Like, like I, I just forgot about the other actors and actresses, even though I love Angela Bassett, Jessica Lange and, um, and Kathy Bates, like she just blew me away with her acting. And then I did a little research and I found what she did before. And those other roles, like she just blew me away. Like even in the recent Chimera, like she just blew me away. You know, she was, she just played it right to a T. She was just, you know, on the ball, you know, with, along with Kathleen Quinlan. I actually asked Mr. Haynes, the director, if he could do a movie with them in the two main roles because they, they needed to do, she needs her own movie. Mm-hmm. So I suggested that she do She-Hulk. Yeah, yeah, we mentioned, yeah, that it does seem like a perfect role for her. I know. I actually bought her a couple of She-Hulk um, <laughs> memorabilia when I went to go visit her. Oh, really? Well, that's very nice of you. Yeah, yeah, and I bought her some comic books, even though recent. I just found out that she didn't read comic books, so I kind of feel bad. Oh, that's all right. I'm sure. I'm sure yeah. she appreciated. I, I I I have three comic books. Actually, I have four. Mm-hmm. But one was the comic book that was about the alien versus predator, mm-hmm. the very first editions that came out. And then I have a She-Hulk, you know, big, big comic book, but that's, that's just me exploring. They only had like one She-Hulk comic book in the whole store. I was like, what the heck? Was it one of the cool John? Like, and I browsed and I browsed and I browsed and and there was nothing. Well, it was, they had the one. But I did buy her like those, um, you know, those Funko, like She-Hulk. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I said, oh, my God, that is so her. <laughs> she holds one of those. Like, it even glows in the dark. The fourth wall. <laughs> what was that, Erica? I even got her um, Wonder Woman jewelry. Oh, nice. Because she just reminds me so much of Wonder Woman. It, mm-hmm. Like, she just can do anything in my eyes. She can do anything. She actually inspired <laughs> me to, you know, get on track with my health, actually. Oh, Cause I well, did that's very nice. So, you know, I'm going to... So she actually inspired me to quit smoking and all that. Mm-hmm. Well, that's very good to hear. Yeah. She's a real... She's a great human being. I love her. Oh. Well, thank you for yep. calling in. appreciate it. Well, on. thank you very much. It was nice talking to you guys. You too. Yeah, it was great talking to me now for being on with us. All right, bye, Erica. I'll see you. Bye, love. Mwah, love from Massachusetts. Bye. Nice, I, bye. I, bye, love. You guys nice. asked me about uh, about She Hulk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's what your was uh, about She Hulk? Um, well, I don't know what it asked at that time, but what is it about She Hulk that you know besides uh, uh, just the. F- you know, that she's a uh, big and everything. What is it about She Hulk that uh, you feel connected to? Well, she gets to break the fourth wall a lot. She's sort of a little. She's a bit, a bit like Deadpool. She breaks the fourth wall a lot. She talks oh, directly to the, the She did. Yeah. Yeah. And um, she's. It, it's like her sexuality gets bigger. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um. And she's not a rage monster like the Hulk is. Right. Mm-hmm. So Jennifer is this like super lawyer with a LLM, like a legacy master's in law. And uh, she goes out, that's the one after the JD. And then, you know, uh, she's really smart, very witty, and she gets to do a lot of fun things. Plus, she changed the power dynamic, which I think is, is really cool, cool about her. She's a very empowering character, like Wonder Woman. Mm-hmm. You see, I don't know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know a lot about the character. I didn't know <laughs> that uh, she was a lawyer or anything like that. So there are a lot of connections. Very interesting. Well, it's David, Jennifer. Jennifer is um, David Banner's cousin, mm-hmm. and through a transfer of blood, um, that's how she becomes She Hulk. Hmm. Yeah. So what what was the jewelry that uh, Nina got you for the Wonder Woman? I got a couple earrings and a lovely uh, a lovely pendants. Uh, it was a, a necklace and some beautiful earrings. 
that have kind of Wonder Woman themes on them. So, mm-hmm. yes, I'm waiting for the right opportunity to wear them. So she's mm-hmm. such a sweetheart. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah that's a great. Ah. I have my Thor earring in right now. You can punch people with that with that ring, punk. <laughs> I probably could. Thor ring. They gotta get you get you with my Thor hammer ring. <laughs> secret secret powers. You know, like 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 the Green Lantern, right? It'll be like the Thor ring. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> like a little <laughs> Thor ring. on it. <laughs> No, uh, oh, come on. My you, you, you all know you all know we all wanted to be superheroes when we grew up oh yeah if I ever grow up I'm definitely wanting to be one <laughs> what would your superpower be hmm let me see yeah a good I, gotta, superpower be? I gotta give that one some thought I think mm-hmm. well, what, would you, what would yours be Erica mine mm-hmm. ooh um, I'd like to be able to control time, Ooh, not my fingers, and make, and make time stop all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. Huh. Then what would you I do? I could get away with what that. Time stopped? I see. <laughs> what would you do when the time stopped? While well, everybody's frozen, I would, uh... Uh-huh. <laughs> hmm. What could you do? What, what, kind of, what kind of mayhem could you get away with? Maybe oh, a couple wedgies. Anything, uh, a, couple, yeah. a couple wedgies. A couple wedgies would happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> that seem like a good use of the superpower. <laughs> well, come on. You gotta have some fun. Exactly. <laughs> After you get past the, I am now a superhero. <laughs> there, there's there's got to be that moment of okay, I need to have fun with my superpowers. Right, oh, yeah. right. Come on, you know you know, you, you got to get bored running around and doing good. You're being the goody two shoes. <laughs> and hey, what if you get jaded and you become a villain? Yeah. yeah. And the villain is always more. It, that's that's the best. Yep. Morally flexible. You have less 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 conflicts. Uh huh. <laughs> Contend with. <laughs> You know, you're not clouded by delusions of grandeur. No, it's just the primacy of the self-interest motivation. Capitalize on your skills. Be Magneto. So would... Oh, yeah. See, I think I'm going with telekinesis. Oh, yeah. I think that's my power. Yeah. I think that would be a fun power. Then I could do naughty things with that, too. You know, if I get bored. <laughs> What would, what would your superhero uh, name more vill- superhero or villain? Uh, no, 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 I'm not. I'm not done with the. Te- I'm not done with the telekinetic one. Would you? Okay, I think it was Chevy uh, Chase right. did this. Would you play? Would, would you pleasure one of a woman uh, with your telekinetic power? Would you Ooh. pleasure a woman from across the room? Well, <laughs> yeah, that that has the whole makings of like a cool Milo Minara comic right there. there I don't know go. if you're familiar with Milo, but he's a great Italian cartoonist. And he does a lot of like erotic cartoons. Like one of his is butterscotch, where a guy uh, he makes this cream that smells like butterscotch, and it turns him invisible. And then he gets to do oh all the God. things that he always wanted to do. Uh, <laughs> well, okay, Neil. What about you? What would your superpower be? Oh man, I you don't, have I don't one. Mm. <laughs> So you should have been thinking during this time. I know. It gave you like a little bit. That's of- right. You got you uh, got to come up with a superpower. Uh, te- teleportation is good. You can Ooh, skip, teleportation's uh, neat. You know, traveling and all. You just go wherever you want to go. So I think teleportation would be good. It'd come in useful. All right, I like I'm thinking that. more of a practical would, would, one. Hmm? Would you would you find yourself kind of sneaking into Fort Knox, going teleport in, <laughs> grab a bar gold, teleport out? Well, what know, do they need it for? Just, They're never going to use it. It's yeah, just laying just, there. Exactly. It's a big pile of gold. Stuff, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That'd be good. Yeah. 
See, and Eric is there to, well, to course, give us ideas on how, how what to use, what to do with these superpowers. I think she's Go got some gold and... villain written all over. <laughs> she's got all these ideas. Uh, yeah, no. Well, I, when, before you get that, I would say stop because I'd be the superhero. <laughs> you're clearly a villain if you tried any of that. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. Stop. Time would stop. I'd catch you. And they, uh, <laughs> the problem is they couldn't keep you because you could tele- teleport out of the prison. Oh yeah, yeah exactly. That was very, very true. Yeah, how do you keep someone uh-huh. who has teleportation in prison? That's a good, good point. Yeah. Uh, so what's the name? Is Are it Wedgie? Is, is it Wedgie Woman? If you're doing the Wedgie. <laughs> now, what would your super name you? Okay, you gotta have a name. What, 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 what uh, would be your name, Neil? Oh, uh, let me think of a what's a good name for someone who can just teleport all over. Um, Porter teleporter. Man. There. <laughs> Porter Man. <laughs> Makes you think of a portable hole from Dungeons and Dragons, but <laughs> put the portable hole up and jump through it. It'd be a good magic right. item to have, though. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and and while we're at D and D, have a bag of holding so you could you know put uh, put all that gold in it. That's true. You can carry it around easier that way. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, I'd be I'd be Quantum Girl. Well, I like that. If you like, yeah, I'd be Quantum Girl. Mm. Okay, what would your name be if your if your superpower is um, telekinesis? Troy, yeah, you t- you said tele- the right Troy mm, telekinesis. Yeah. I don't know what. Hmm. I'm trying to think of a cool costume to kind of go with it. <laughs> I think I think I usually think more visually, so trying to tie it all together. Um. Well, I, I, I like like Magneto. Magneto was just sort of nonchalant. Just yeah. Like walk in there and wave the hand, and all of a sudden, anything metal around you would just crush or you can manipulate it. <laughs> but he had that bitch and cape and like the the coolest helmet, I think, too. Like that old Jack Kirby helmet on Magneto was just so cool. That's right. That's right. You know, if there's any metal in in in, in the police officer zipper, you make the metal in the zipper attack. <laughs> <laughs> get it, get it, get it, get it. <laughs> yeah, I think they kind of give you a wide berth at that point. Like, okay, no. no, I think I, 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 come on, guys. That's where my mind would go. Oh yeah. Right? The, the, the zipper would open up and go munch, 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 munch. <laughs> oh god! Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you have to have a theme song, right? Because I, 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 I like I like, I like the one this. from the, the first class, right? When 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 Magneto get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. You, you always have to have good theme music for a movie. Mm-hmm. And I like it. So when what would your a... theme music be? Sing, sing your theme song, there, Neil. What, what would your <laughs> I like the teleporting theme song. Because <laughs> you 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 got you gotta fly in there. You know there you are. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> that's very that's a very menacing one. Yeah. Yeah, I was just kind of going. See, see, I can't. I, I have to. Have, I have to have him uh, ever do mine at, at the very least. Nice. So, right. Tony, what about you? What's your theme song sound like? Um, let me see. If I, I was thinking, I might be like the Mind Wave. I was thinking that might be. I don't know if that's a good good oh, name oh, or not. Oh, oh, something like that then would be good for the Mind Wave. Th- yeah. th- think, think of right. Kind of like the a, X-Files. Yeah, I was thinking. Right. <laughs> I was thinking I, something from like the old Star Trek, but not quite uh, like a dun 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 dun, dun, dun kind of thing. <laughs> I don't think there but should Star be any music. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> the Star Trek will go by in between. <laughs> That's why I love Lucy. I always get those confused. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I could definitely, I, I could get a Lucy theme going. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think there there should be any action. Da, 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 da. <laughs> no. I, I love movie scenes. 
Well, it creates the brand. I mean, music is so important to a brand, especially brand recognition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think you know, we, if, if, if we if, make. If, if I know. said sing, if I said sing the theme to Gilligan's Island, could you do it? Hmm. Right? It's it's a simple mm-hmm. rhythm. But I bet you won't be able to do it for John Carpenter's the thing. <laughs> Good mm, point. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> right. It's pretty dark. It's it's a background noise. It's more of a background noise. It actually plays a part in creating the tension of the movie. It's the same guy that did the music for that did the music for Fistful of Dollars for a few dollars more in the Good, Bad, and the Ugly. Oh no kidding! And just and just recently yeah. in the Tarantino movie, um, the recent Tarantino movie he did too. The Hateful Eight. The Hateful Eight. Yeah. Oh no kidding! Wow, and those old Sergio Leone movies. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's mm-hmm. awesome. In fact, I think some of the Hateful Eight, uh, some of the score was stuff that was originally written for the thing. Then they used oh, yeah? it in the Hateful Eight. Yeah. I didn't know that. I See, those are two movies, though. Yeah. Kurt Russell with, like, rugged facial hair and snow. <laughs> make for, like, the perfect movie. Mm-hmm. I think if we ever make a movie, instead of having a score, we should just have Erica do, do it, uh, you know, like a humming. That would be totally be badass. All... Exactly. That would be perfect. Exactly. No instruments of the smell. I think that would totally work. Uh, I, I did like you guys? It, did you guys? Did you guys? Did you guys see? Did you guys see Chimera? Yeah, yeah. I have not. Neil has, but I haven't. Yeah, I saw it, and uh, like I said, I had, uh, I had Maurice on the show uh, a few months ago. I don't know, maybe maybe it was last year, but uh, yeah, I really liked the movie and. Uh, that was great. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you want to ask me anything about Chimera? Well, let's see. It was. Uh, I, uh, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't want to. I, I don't want to give too much of it away. But there's, if you saw it, there's there's someone whistling in it, and I'm whistling in it. Mm. Whistling. I uh, say I don't remember that. I whistle. After uh, I whistle a tune. Hmm. It was March when I when I when I watched it had him on the interview. Hmm. Yeah, I did. I did. I did a bit. Of, I did a bit of whistling. Mm-hmm. Can you do the whistling now or? Yeah. <laughs> I do remember that. Now. Mm-hmm. It's Mozart. Uh, yeah, you have a very, you have very good whistling abilities. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, whistle strong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I whistle shirt. well. <laughs> whistle strong. That would be a great shirt. Yeah, exactly. Maybe that could be your, your superhero name, Whistle Strong. Excellent. Have like a, a powerful That's whistle. Catchy, I gotta say. Yeah, you could like blow down buildings with your whistle. Hmm. By the way, I do want to say uh, Jordan here on uh, Twitter says, uh, I just want to give a shout out to Erica. Thank you for being a great inspiration for a lot of young teenagers who don't really fit in and encourage them to be a light that outshines the darkness. Thanks, Erica, for all her support. And I wish her the awesome. best. Wow. So, uh, Thank you guys so much for having me on. You're very welcome. When you hear something like that, when someone says that you are an inspiration uh, for a teenager, for people or anyone who does a fit in, uh, you know, what do you think of that? And uh, who are your inspirations? Well, I have a couple. I have uh, an actor and a, and a model and a one of my inspirations when I was really little was Carolyn Coffey. Um, she was a model who was outed and um, harmed her career, but she persevered, wrote books, and advocated for our rights in the early 80s and 90s. So she's been at it for a while. She's an she uh, amazing woman. And um, I think Corey Everson, Corey Everson, uh, a fitness. Oh, yeah. 
athlete, a fitness model in the 80s that inspired me. You can change your body. And because uh, a lot of work I do is based on fitness. The actors I've mentioned in the horse, including Jessica Lang, it's just a blessing mm-hmm. to get to work with her. It's a, a master study in acting mm-hmm. to be able to work with such a constant professional and just an inimitable talent. I, it just blows me away. And when I get a chance to do it again, I feel very blessed, number one. Mm-hmm. But to be more specific about role models, of course, um, actors that are role models, ooh, that's a tough one. Uh, Meryl Streep is a positive role model. Um, I like humanity, you know. Uh, that's, that, that, that'll, that'll give you enough for now. Okay. So I, I, uh, I, I post a lot of fitness on my Facebook page. And there's a, a gentleman that recently just kicked some serious, serious butt doing a, uh, an amazing pole vault. Uh, I'm just amazed by people who, can, who have a high physical IQ uh-huh. and are able to propel themselves faster further, stronger, and keep pushing through. Because this life, this life is a challenge. And it's, it's, competition is plenty tough 40 hours a week, but that drops drastically after that 40. And keep, what keeps you going? What motivates you to get up early and stay up late? It, it's desire. You have to want this more than anything else in the world. Okay? Mm-hmm. And part of it's about self-love and finding a value in life and a way to give back to other people. That's what it's really about. Mm -hmm. Being a light from which to see for others. Do you get a lot of people like that? Who? who, That's great. I would say, do you get a lot of people like that who do say uh, you're an inspiration to them? Well, I I try to be humble. There's a fine line between heroism and hubris. You know, I, I, I try not to attack anybody else. I mean, you can't make your light shine brighter by trying to blow someone else's out. And I don't uh, subscribe to political correctness in its form that it is right now to narrow thought and to force people to conform to um, stipulated languages and definitions. Um, I find that to be off-putting and frightening, especially as we move in the future. You know, there's a lot of authoritarian control in that. And um, they just recently had the monk debates in Canada where they discussed that. And I think I'll post a link to that on my Twitter feed so you all can see this debate about political correctness that that's affecting comedy. It's narrowing the viewpoint. And I want to refer back to John Stuart Mill's chapter two on liberty. Mm-hmm about accepting contrary authority, about accepting an opposing viewpoint. Even if your viewpoint is is right, a contrary viewpoint will test your viewpoint and maybe even adjust it a little bit more by hearing someone out. You know, there's so many equity proposals that are thrown out there and because you object to an equity proposal, it doesn't mean you're against equity. It means you're against the Trojan horse policy that's implemented in your proposal, your proposition. And what people end up doing is they, they accuse you of labels when you do that, because what you're doing is engaging in epistemic pushback, mm-hmm. which is considered against their equity proposal, right? Just when you just want to clar- clarify and ask a question about something like that. So I'm challenged because there's a lot of people who have um, wanted to elevate being pulled over by a police officer. If you're black, the person who calls the police officer on the person who is, is, is black can be charged with a swatting charge, like a malum prohibitum, you know, it's preventing people from calling, which will create a chilling effect on people from calling the police. If you understand what I'm talking about. Yep. Okay. That's a little too draconian. I think what we have to do is educate the society. We have to, it's not a, a, a racial issue. It is a policing and reporting issue. 
I'm sure there are cases when they're false reports, but how do you answer the question? What is your definition of suspicious? What is your definition of suspicious? What is my, oh, there's an actual question? Uh, That's an actual that, question. That, yeah, well, I don't know if it was, you know, uh, what is my definition of suspicious? Uh, that's a good question, because uh, I think it gets more of a feeling than, like, uh, you know, like, I can't explain what someone would look like if they're suspicious. I think you just feel like, hey, that's suspicious, that person over there. Uh, I don't know if I have a definition right. of it. Mm-hmm. it would, because I there's think a finding of false report. Mm-hmm. Right, because there's a finding of intent mm-hmm. in a false report. You have to intentionally file a false report. Everyone's definition of suspicious is different, and right. that's where the police come in. And you know, no always been safe and sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I don't think we need to elevate or to make the law more authoritarian. Mm-hmm. That's playing right into sexual predators' hand because most of the laws are vacancy. <laughs> trespass, laying in wait, loitering are boundary protection laws. And making someone afraid to call the police. I mean, the Starbucks case, the barbecue okay. case, the Yale student case. None of these individuals have been harmed. Mm-hmm. The police, I mean, obviously the police have been called. And they, they, these are marginal cases, of course. And, 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 the Oakland Merritt, Lake Merritt barbecue case of a, a disaster for the woman. Okay? Mm-hmm. But no one was harmed and reputations are destroyed. They've been labeled racist forever. I just find that to be a bit specious mm-hmm. with the correlation mm-hmm. argument. The, 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 the Trojan horse in that argument is if the, if the demand is for a uh, unchecked Malum prohibitive law on someone to calling the police would prevent women from calling the police if they're threatened. Mm-hmm. That plays right into sexual predators' hands. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, that, that woman. I mean, she's be- she's become a meme now. You know, I mean, she's all over the internet. You know, you know. It's I know. Yes, it's the psychology of newspeak. It's the postmodernist mm-hmm. POMO script. You know. Now, I will say that the, the, uh, uh, the people from um, the Starbucks case, mm-hmm. uh, when they went to court, though, they just wanted a dollar. It was just more of, uh, you know, they didn't go for a lot of money anyways. They just they wanted a dollar in, in damages. There's more of a point to them. But uh, How I are they thought, damaged? I agree with that. So I've been, you know, around where I live, It's uh, you could go to a place and there's not many people, so it's not a big deal. But when I've been to Starbucks in the city... Uh, sometimes there's a there's a line outside, out literally outside the door, so I could see how someone's there not buying something, how it, annoying it is for other customers and and the people working there. So uh, does that mean you have to call police? I don't know, but uh, still at the same time, I I never go to a, to a place and not buy something, so I could see how it would be uh, annoying for the the people there. You know, I think you have to mm-hmm. look at everything on on everyone's side, you know, both sides. But again, like you said, they weren't harmed. Uh, I mean, it was an annoyance, but uh, they didn't. They didn't. Uh, there's no damages. They didn't go to jail or, or, or anything. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Well, you know, it's the Kafka trapping that goes on. You know, mm-hmm. sophisticated and falsifiable form of argument that attempts to overcome an opponent by inducing a sense of guilt and using the opponent's denial of guilt as further evidence of the guilt. You know, the the slap of the stigma label of racist that's specklessly thrown out there all the time is mm-hmm. a silencing tool, and it's terrible. And political oh, yeah. correctness is is has run amok. And I think we need to engage in a little bit of self examination. You know, when I told you about the equity proposal, you know, resistance is considered like an you know, like an epistemic pushback. You know, and then engage. Well, you're a racist. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Well, your 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 denial of such means you're a racist. It's a constructed conspiracy theory that denotes that you are the accusation and guilty because accusation equals guilt without facts of racism. Mm-hmm. 
And that's another frustration that I have. And, and it forces you to take a sideline and not engage, especially when you have something valuable to say. Does that make any sense? Yeah. 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 Exactly. yeah. And you don't, like you exactly said, you don't want people to be afraid to call uh, police or ask for help. Uh, because they, well, what if I'm wrong? And then, then I'm considered a racist or, uh, or false, you know, false accusation, but you want to stay mm-hmm. safe. So you want, you want people to be able to, uh, to try to get help if they, if they're afraid of something or think they're, in, I think something we live in a, you know, I think we live in a fragility culture and I think millennials in particular, because the helicopter parents when they were young, you know, the, the, the thought that we have to understand that there's an authoritarian system, both on the right and left. And there's both, you know, conservative correctness and far left correctness. It's going on in this discussion. But people, we live in this, you know, fragility culture. It's very, you know, Manichaeanism, you know, um, good versus evil binary, tribalism, personal attacks, you know, ad hominem albus. You can see it regularly. Um, I'm going to quote a piece of case law to you, like Fletcher versus... Western National Life Insurance. And this is what the law of uh, emotional stress looks like. You know, complete emotional tranquility is seldom attainable in this world. And some degree of transient and trivial emotional stress is part of the price of living amongst people. The law intervenes only when the distress inflicted is so severe that no reasonable man or woman could be expected to endure it. Now, this sets up a two threshold. There's a certain amount of emotional threshold that we're supposed to just take on about like, if that's the normal, the normalcy of life, but they've come up with this new thing called, um, what do they, what do they call it? It's called, oh, microaggressions. Have you ever heard of that phrase? Yes. No, I haven't. Yeah, I have. And Basically, if you look at this 46 Restatement of Tort Supra that creates a primer, that's a, a primer, you know, transient emotional stress, that's level one, is you know, part of everyday life and it's something we have to endure. And then the law only intervenes when emotional stress reaches a threshold that the law has to intervene to prevent severe harm. Right? Mm-hmm. Well, it's now the outrage uh, complaint. Microaggressions have taken on here, and they're so liberally defined that people have to be extraordinarily fragile, and they make the complaint. It goes overboard. It goes too far, in my humble opinion. If that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it takes away from creativity, and I think we need to see less of that in the future and more diversity of thought brought out into the world. I love podcasts because you guys can do anything you want. You know what I mean? For now. Right? You guys yeah. can tackle, tackle things uh-huh. that you may not see in mainstream media. You guys can be the avant-garde on the cutting edge of, of criticizing um, science fiction and science fact. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have a wonderful opportunity to do that. I think it's just an absolute, it's part of participating in this life. So. <coughs> mm-hmm. Am I making any <laughs> sense at all? <laughs> yes, oh, yeah. Definitely. Yep. Sorry. Uh, definitely. So, mm. Do you guys keep, a- up, keep up on the high tech out there? Keep up on the, on the technology? Yeah. Uh, well, what do you mean by that? Well, Google, for one thing, and uh-huh. the ubiquitousness of, of, of social networks and phones, you know, cell phone addiction, and the invasion of our privacy through Facebook selling our data to people. Mm-hmm. We are so Pavlovian in this, the way we look at our phones. Mm-hmm. It makes me wonder, are we able to integrate with technology? Since my first 
con- you know, our first conversation about uh-huh. transhumanism. You know, are we going to have a phone in our head in the future? Are we going to be, are we going to be like part that. cyborgs? Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. So this is, this is where I'm going with this. Are, you know, are we going to be so policed that our thoughts are going to be policed? They're already doing it. Uh-huh. They're already doing it. And they use shame as a way to prevent inconvenient facts from ent- entering the field. And I find that to be a bit problematic. What do you mean by that? That you shame to uh, to prevent? Well, I, I I made mention of it earlier. Uh-huh. Um, oh, it, it, I talked about it. I guess we are fragile human beings. We go back a hundred years and we figure out how much we've improved over time in terms of pollution and poverty. We pretty much eliminated poverty compared to what it was 100 years ago. 100 years ago, 90% of the world lived in poverty. Only 10% of the world lives in poverty today. But the only thing we see on the news is negative. You understand? Yeah. What does that do to you? What does that do to us? No. You asked me. I mean, it, 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 it's a corruption of truth. Like you, you never see the news showing up and saying, today, good news happened right here. <laughs> no, no, it's all fear mongering and things like that. Right, right. Because they, they have so little, it's, it's, they've got to create catastrophe and yep. outrage. So it's almost a rage. It's, it's a race. If it bleeds, it leads. Happiness doesn't create news. Mm. That, that mean, even the weather. The things, just, I was just thinking that, Neil. You see that yeah. even now with the weather, it's like, yeah, because, this is the coldest January that we have seen in 120 years. And da ba da da you know. We're all going to freeze. Yep. Because our know. grandmother gets terrified when she watches the news. It's, mm-hmm. it's just a horrible thing. Like, I kind of mm-hmm. lean her to, like, the game show network or something. <laughs> Because you don't really know a 94-year-old woman getting terrified that, you know, it's going to rain too hard today. And it was it's kind of like the, the boy who cried wolf this year, because every time there's uh, any kind of snow, they always say it's, you know, going to be, you know, just insane and stuff. But then this year we did uh, here, we had three nor'easters, <laughs> and we yep. actually lost power for, for several days. But going into it, I thought, well, they always say this, so, you know, why even worry about it? But... You know, then the one time it actually happened. <laughs> yep, that's true. So, have you guys uh, heard about Morgan Freeman? Is now uh, now a new part. I just Me saw Too. that today. The Me Too McCarthyism. Oh my god. Yeah. Well, uh, I was. I, 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 was I, I saw some of it. Some of it just because uh, we actually uh, Troy and I were out to eat earlier today, and it was on the news. And uh, a couple of things was like, well, that's kind of, but some of the stuff I didn't even get, they were like, look at his eyes. And like, it was like a panel, it was like four people. And I guess he was looking down like at her somewhere, but it wasn't, I don't know. I just thought, well, I don't really see how that's really anything. It's just kind of human nature in some way. It wasn't like he was like being uh, obscene or something. Uh, there was a couple of things where someone said, like uh, he asked, he said, you know, said something that was like inappropriate, obviously. And then one part was like he was in an interview, interview, like kind of like a, you know, an entertainment interview. And like the woman said, how are you? And he was like, oh, I'm better now looking at her. And I was like, well, he's that's an 80 year old guy. Yeah, you know, it's, it's so kind of like, and she laughed and stuff. It was yeah. just kind of like almost kind of corny thing that a lot of pe- you see people say all the time on stuff. So I thought, well, uh-huh. I don't really I don't really get that. But there was some stuff that uh, there, there was no uh, there was no video of this, but some things that like he supposedly put his hand up someone's skirt. Now that obviously is, is out of line. But some of it, well, like I, I was really just like I, I didn't really see what the uh, what the big deal was. And I don't know what I it struggle. happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I say that, it's like. Um, because some some of the other people that obviously I'm against any type of actual sexual harassment, but I don't think um, you can judge people uh, for something they did like in the '70s based on today's standards. <coughs> mm-hmm. Not that it was cool or anything, but if something was accepted, then it's you know 
it's different to, to bring what it up. What I don't like, what I don't like is instead of adjudicating the things based on fact, people rely on accusation as guilt mm-hmm. without oh, that's true. having a case being brought before a trier of fact. And you create these kangaroo courts and these NGOs that are not competent courts of jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I also don't think everything's it's not. It's it's it, 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 it's it's not a fair trial. It's mm-hmm. guilt by accusation because you're supposed to believe women, and that's where I draw the line. There's something called the doctrine of latches. It's a French word meaning lazy. Latches. It's an yeah. equitable doctrine. It means those who sit on the laurels don't deserve their rights, because the person who wants to make the accusation can prejudice the other person's case because over time, memories fade, evidence gets lost, Mm -hmm. and or witnesses pass away. You understand what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's a form of McCarthyism and authoritarian control over the narrative. And that's what I find. This is my challenge with it. Do you understand? Uh, yeah, I understand because it's uh, a few months ago. I was going to bring this up, but a um, uh, former co-host here on the show accused me of mm-hmm. sexual harassment. Accused me of sexual harassment, and I never right. met her. So all of our correspondence was through Facebook message or here on the show. So, I've, and mm-hmm. so she literally the uh, the uh, definition of showing things out of context would cut you know parts of our conversation out but she would leave well, first of all it wasn't even just between her and i it was it was in a, a group chat of me her troy and uh jason minton who does our written reviews and she would take little mm-hmm. uh things and cut them out and but then she would leave out her reply of lmafo you laughed my ass off or her replies or things she mm-hmm. said beforehand uh that were even worse there or she even posted pictures saying that I sent them and she had sent them. And they were, to me, just silly things anyway. It was... But anyway, uh, so I, some people told me not, just don't even, like, uh, don't even acknowledge it. It'll make you look guilty, which didn't make sense to me, because I think if you don't say anything, that makes you look more guilty if you say something. So I took all the screenshots of the actual conversations and, and, and audio for the show, and I put it up on the website, because uh, it's... I think it was a slap in the face to real victims, you know, not just, not just trying to get, you know, ruin my name or anything, but, and, you know, it's trying to latch on to the Me Too movement when, when it's, it's, it was just totally bogus. Anyone who actually looks at it can see it's bogus. I don't even think it's a matter of, you know, a debate. It's no, it wasn't clearly, even an opinion uh-huh. thing. No, it's just clearly here's stuff. Something, here's here's something, I, t- t- Tony and Neil, here's something I know. I'm trying to say, try, try, Neil, here's something I know. Mm-hmm. Because I, I'm transgender. I've been on both sides of the fence. You know, I understand sexual behavior between green adults. Is, you know, it's very dysregulated. It's often filled by, mm-hmm. fueled by alcohol and drugs, and all sorts of things happen that people regret. Mm-hmm. We don't know what to do about it. So blaming men with impunity, impunity seems to be the feminist fallback. There's no moral self-examination. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't believe all of the Me Too movement's premises and accusations without evidence yep. and they want to be able to accuse without evidence however you know, what we're doing is we're setting up a parallel judicial system to deal with these matters and it's making it worse it, these are kangaroo court systems with very little due process to mount a defense for the accused against unwarranted accusation and these extra judicial ngos they, they you know they create a ton of collateral damage oh yeah you know, and I don't buy into the argument, inability to report alleged sexual misconduct gives you a right to set up a biased court system after the fact, which is a, you know, w- which in a normal courtroom, the doctrine of latches is an affirmative defense. This, you know, these cases aren't being litigated. Okay, in an impartial courtroom, if you guys understand what's going on, mm-hmm. right? Um, yeah, and I also think uh, the, the, bo- all- the, bo- the, the, the the bottom the bottom line is is internal departments like when Amazon um, let go Jeffrey Tamborn, 
they have their own bias. Their own internal department has a bias. He wasn't given a fair trial, okay? He was lynched because the community didn't want him on the show. And I hear both sides, but it's he said versus she said. And we're supposed to believe one side over the other just because they're, you know, identified women, really? Yeah, now it seems like once the accusation comes out, then they're automatically guilty. And it's just crazy. Right. Courts of competent jurisdiction, you know, that are fair and partial are very difficult to create. And they require adversarial parties in an action with very complex rules of engagement with competent agents, you know, attorneys, trained attorneys. However, setting up these quasi extra judiciary operations by proxy without the proper expertise of delineated rights of defense, you know, where you use the preponderance of evidence, for example, leads to chaos. Mm-hmm. Then the Me Too movement becomes McCarthyism, and it, nail, it, it enables to go on these witch hunts, which isn't going to make this better. Right. We've turned unfortunate sexual encounters, which is what happens when you put men and women in the same space at work, and we don't know what to do about it. We really don't. There aren't real rules about this. I don't expect <laughs> listening to Jordan Peterson you know, about this, but I, I like listening to him. I, I listen to a lot of... Um, speakers I read more than most people can forget. But we don't have rules to deal with these silly accusations other than, you know, blame men. You know, a man looking is, is now a crime. We aren't addressing the real problem. But we're operating these sequential witch hunts that make the, the prosecutors of the witch hunts feel like they're moral. We're not having an adult conversation about this, and I think we need to. That's one of the problems I'm saying. Oh, that's really well I think, said. That's true. And I think everything's lumped together as, as equally as bad, too. Like, um, someone who patted someone on, on the butt 1978, like on a movie set, isn't the same as someone who actually raped somebody or or who, uh, um, uh, I forget, the, the director who molested you know a kid on the set of... Uh, uh, the clown movie there, but uh, you know, not everything is equally as bad. Something, you know, if right. that makes sense, it seems like uh, everyone is accused of anything, they're all lumped into one category. But there's a lot of you know, different there's a difference between uh, you know, Bill Cosby mm-hmm. uh, drugging people and have sex with them, you know, and Dustin Hoffman or whoever, you know, maybe patting someone, their actress on, on you know, on the behind or you know, in a movie in, in the 70s. There's a huge difference between the two. Mm-hmm. Well, here's a Swiftian proposal for you. Is it possible that the outbreak of toxic masculinity stems not from the fact that masculinity is innately toxic? You know, funny mm. how people hate essentialism except when it doesn't apply to them. <laughs> but because there is a culture-wide loathing of all things that are coded male. That there is, in fact, in 2018, no way for a boy to grow up decently into a, into a man except to become, you know, a hairy woman or something like that. And I'm not picking on my own folks being transgender, but, I, and I don't want to, look, when Trump got elected, it polarized the politics, completely polarized the politics, okay? People aren't working together. Conservatives have a mindset, but they're not authoritarian. Conservatives like neat little boxes, right? Progressives like to move them around to think for the future. They got to work together. They're both right and they're both wrong and they have blind spots, but they have to work together. They have to come to the table. And right now you have authoritarian uh, entities, a radical on both sides that don't, that are controlling them, that are pulling people apart. What needs to happen is, you know, I think the right has done a really good job of, of controlling it, its radicals, you know, of being able to send them in, you know, like the Nazi, the people that, that you know, the David Duke versus that, you know, William F. Buckley Jr., right? That's a very kind of different group in, the, in itself, and they're not platforms. But you don't see that on the left. I would like to say, you know, I'm a classical liberal, right? I'm a little left the center, but the left, the radical left, the far left has moved into this authoritarian control. They don't like conical hierarchies. They're just very you know, privileged, shamey, all day long, victim mentality, 
all day long and it goes on and on and on and on. It just never stops. And it's frustrating. Even feminism has, has their own cross to bear. I mean, no self-examination, <coughs> seriously. They've got, they've got a few bad things that they've done in the past. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, how could people... Uh, how can people follow uh, follow you online to uh, uh, see what you're doing and uh, to uh, to follow uh, thoughts like this? Well, we just talked about a whole bunch of different discussions, guys. That are, we just talked yeah, about, well, you know, sexual well, harassment. Saying, hey, uh-huh. Well, I'm saying, uh, you know, I, I'm uh, sure on your social media you talk about uh, fun things, silly things, and then more important things. Yeah, so I how, do, how can I people do, I follow do, I you? Put, yeah. I, I put like it I'm at Amazon uh-huh. Eve on Twitter. I'm at Amazon Eve on Twitter. That's where, I, that's where I usually reside. That's that's the easiest way to find me. Mm-hmm. I keep it simple. I'm kind of running away from having a here. Twitter's where I, I reside now. We'll leave it there. And I don't want to run around with fifty thousand gazillion social networks okay. anymore. I Just you. keep it simple, guys. Mm-hmm. I guess. Well, it's been great to have you all. At, been, at, uh, at, both. You go on. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yep, it's been a great show. Thank, Thank you so yeah. much. It's been both. Hey, uh, um, yeah. Was there any questions I need to answer? Is there anything I, I missed? Uh, let's see here. Well, Keys wants to know what was the most exciting scene to shoot for American Horror Story Freak Show and why? Mm, that's a good one. Um, fight scene with Michael Checklist. Oh, awesome. Okay. Of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did, were you a fan uh, of the he, Shield? He taught me how to Go on, sorry. Of course I was. This is big. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, okay, you got to do a fight scene. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm like busting my ass in the gym doing Krav Maga because this is Vic from the Shield. Like <laughs> checklist, he played the thing in the Fantastic Four. I gotta, I feel like I gotta be able to. <laughs> so I'm in there. Okay, by the time I said I'm taking on the entire class. Okay, so now, I'm, now I'm ready for Michael Checklist. So I found it, it's all choreographed. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> <laughs> little plug. I love you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Chicklitz is an awesome man. Great mm-hmm. man. Great talent. Great artist. Amazing actor. Very humble. Yes, very giving. Very, very shared. Very present. Mm-hmm. I learned a lot. I learned so much doing that. And um, mm-hmm. you learn a lot. You learn every day. Mm-hmm. Every day of your life, you learn. Every step, you learn. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dominic Weeble Figuera wants to know, uh, what was your favorite place yes. to film a freak show in New Orleans? Ooh. Hmm. He's from New Orleans. <sighs> okay, we're going, to say, we're going to say favorite. Uh, we had two places. We had the external shots, which was out in the swamp, and I just got eaten alive by mosquitoes, but it was beautiful. Uh, studio. I would say, you know, when we shot outside, it was nice outside. We, 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 our external scene was just beautiful, just so beautiful. The colors, that 1950s look, outside was very nice. We had the best craft services, too. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> the best. Outside, it's like okay. having a barbecue. So lovely. You gotta, if you can deal with the prehistoric, like, thumb-sized mosquitoes, <laughs> you're good to go. Uh-huh. Uh, where was the best stuff? Uh, food that you've had? Uh, you're working the mo- in in movies or film? Was it New Orleans best food? Uh-huh. Yeah, New, New Orleans is, is a foodie place. It's mm-hmm. it's where like the best chefs are, so you know they kind of congregate there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you have anything good in Boston? I love Boston, mm-hmm. but we stayed in Finchburg, so I didn't have a lot of chance. Uh, I see. Some of the pubs down there uh, by the courthouse, I like. Mm-hmm. You know, old school things. Yeah. 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 We'll go to the I like north the... end with me and Neil, and mm-hmm. we'll show you some good places. Yeah, mm-hmm. a lot of good Italian food. I like, I like a lot of Love China, Italian a lot food. Of, uh-huh. A lot of good stuff in Chinatown, too, in Boston. Oh, yeah, true. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, yeah, I, well, I had Matt Fra- we had Matt Fraser on the show a few years ago when uh, when when Freak Show had just oh, ended, yeah. Yeah, and he was a great guest. Yeah, yeah. do you have any uh, memories of work with Matt? Well, Matt gave me a lesson because you know, I'm transgender, but there's a freak factor to my life being a six foot eight woman. Mm-hmm. People see the six foot eight first; 
like they, God, you're the tallest woman I've ever seen. You know, that, that's, that is something I didn't expect going from male to female in my life. It's a different paradigm. You know, a six foot eight woman's going to get noticed in the world like I was uh-huh. trying to hide, right? <laughs> sure. So this thing called the extraordinary body narrative and how to see that we're contributing members of society. And I feel that transgender people have more in common with that narrative than LGBT politics. You know, that's why our condition is medically um, handled mm-hmm. instead. Mm-hmm. But I, I have certain political disagreements with the definition of transgender. It's so broadly defined, it's almost meaningless at this stage. So, you know, I, I have my questions, but I stay out of that political discussion because uh, it's not my, my venue at this mm-hmm. stage. Now, uh, how about Ben Wolf, who you know who passed away uh, not that long ago? Ben what Wolf and like? Rose yeah. Siggins, two of my co-stars. Yeah, Ben Wolf and Rose Siggins both passed away, and I went to both memorials, mm-hmm. and I was very sad. Um, I was hoping to work with Ben on a project, you know, just mm-hmm. something fun that we could build, because he looks like a little man. He could play like the big boss, and I could be his <laughs> you know, enforcer. <laughs> No, but uh, looks looks so deceiving. He's a pool shark. Mm-hmm. Play a wicked game of pool. Oh no, kidding! Oh, really? Okay. And Rose's arms, because only she only has arms, are strong as your legs, but as amb- as with ambulation, ambul- ambulatory dexterity of a, of an arm. She mm-hmm. gave me a hug once. And pretty much almost crushed me. So. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I appreciate it. Matt, Matt, yeah. Matt is also amazing. He's such a love and so pretty. Yeah. He's a gorgeous man. Mm. Uh, yeah, was, I hope he's really, well. I love yeah. you, Matt, if you're listening. <laughs> and Jody, too. Jody Omgi, I love you, too, if you can hear this. <laughs> Very cool. And that was always, uh, she, it always seems like uh, everyone with, with her always had so much fun. Like seeing pictures of you two together, you both seem to be really happy. Mm hmm. Yeah, so I'm throw it out there. Yeah, so uh, it's been. I appreciate um, coming on, and maybe uh, when thanks, Dead guys. Squad, when Dead Squad comes out, you can come back on and, and tell us about it. Yeah, sir. Well, I'm excited yeah. about that too. But we, we have more to talk about, so do reach out to me, guys. You have my contact details. All right, All right. And we'll do it again. Look forward All to right. it. Sounds yes. very good. Thank you. Thanks a ton. Thanks, guys. You have a lovely evening. Hola, this is Gigi Saul Guerrero from Lucho Gore Productions, and you're listening to Without Your Head.